second reading comes again from Daniel, and it's sort of the rest of the story. You have already heard it from the Jesus Storybook Bible, um, but hear it again. And this is actually Daniel in the lion's den from the sixth chapter in this reading from the NRSV translation. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house which had windows in its upper room open towards Jerusalem. And to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to God and praise Him just as he had done previously. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. Then they approached the king and con said concerning the edict, O king, did you not sign an edict that anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions? The king answered, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they responded to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the edict you have signed, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel. And until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. And the conspirators came to the king and said to him, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. And the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. And the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions, when he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lion? Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forevermore. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him and also before you. O king, I have done no wrong. And the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel was taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king gave a command and those who had accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den. They, their children, and their wives before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. May God bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding of God's holy word. Amen. So we've been working and, and asking the hard question of why are these children's stories, especially in light of that last verse, right? You notice that last verse got left out of the Jesus Storybook Bible. The, the conspirators being tied up, tossed into the, to the den themselves, not just them, but also their wives and their children. Not pretty things. That's not stuff we want to, to sort of lift up and celebrate. But that's the story. And yes, we have sanitized this story, and we've sanitized the other stories as well that we've shared over the last few weeks, but I hope that you've heard these stories from the Old Testament with new, uh, a fresh perspective, maybe something you've never heard before jumped out at you that you could understand a little bit more. I mean, these are children's stories for all the right reasons because they offer us life lessons of what it means to be bold and faithful, to practice forgiveness, to love, and, and ultimately to point us to a God who saves. 
so we approach this story just like we've done the last few in which we ask the question, what do we learn about ourselves and what do we learn about God through these stories? You see, we're pointed immediately to, to, to God because Daniel was much like Christ in that he knew the consequences of remaining faithful to God. I mean, that Daniel would get in trouble because of what he was doing. Because of the evilness, the jealousy that exists inside the hearts of the Babylonians, they, they wanted to, to concoct a plan that would rid themselves of this Hebrew son once and for all. So being told never to worship again, Daniel doesn't waver. He doesn't even think twice as reported. I, I imagine he had some inner consternation when it came to this situation, I'm sure, but, but he never wavers. Remains disciplined in praying to God three times every day. Three times. We must remember that Daniel was in captivity. So he was not in a place. He had endured and had endured having his people taken into slavery, being dragged to a foreign land, removed from the home that he had loved. It was raining hard. That's probably what Daniel thought. The rain falls down on him hard as he's taken up, as he's drugged into slavery. But rather than languish in fear, in despair, in hopelessness, Daniel thrived in his new situation. I've said this to you before. And I'm going to say it over and over and over again. You and I, we, will find ourselves in situations not of our own choosing. <clears throat> Circumstances that we simply do not want to be in. But, the choice we have is how we will respond. Oftentimes, that's the only thing we control. We are control people. I have not yet met anyone who have said, yeah, I'm not a control freak. All of us want to be in some form of control. It's a varying degree. Some of us are a little bit more intense. Others, less so. But we all want to be in some form of control. And oftentimes, the only thing we can control is how we will respond to a set situation. We're going to be thrust into positions in which we did not want to be. We want to wish that, wish that on our worst enemy, but yet we have to deal with it. And so we have two options. We can wallow in our own self-pity, our helplessness. We can complain and fuss about how things are not fair. Or we can attempt to live faithfully, no matter what comes our way keeping our eyes focused on God, much like Daniel. Again, if this is too uncomfortable for you to think about as yourself, because there are people in our lives that we can identify with right away. They are the fussy, griping, complaining people. You know them. Some of you might be them every now and then. I should say some of us. Because I'm that way. Every now and then, I, I get blinded. I only hear the rain falling or seeing the, that, the hard rain. You can't see it, but it's, it's bad. I mean, it's coming down hard right now. Sometimes that's me. I only sit there and I, that's all I can see is I get that tunnel vision of how bad things are and how things will never be better than they are right now. That is a dangerous, dangerous temptation, friends. I think that's one of the ways the devil gets his way sometimes in our lives. It's because he puts blinders up and we can only see the negative all around us. 
See, Daniel demonstrates for us in a very real and concrete way what it means to remain faithful to God, to choose to respond to a situation in a positive, constructive way rather than to simply wallow in self-pity and doubt. He never loses focus of God. In fact, you might could even go so far as his focus on God is heightened. Each day, Daniel goes and prays three times. And not just three times. He goes, he opens his window, he looks in the direction that Jerusalem would be a very long way away. Even in a foreign land, even in times of struggle, Daniel keeps his eyes focused on God. Three times a day. This seems insignificant. To a lot of us, three times a day, it's like, eh, it's how much. But to Daniel, it was, it was immensely important. I had a guy one time come out of church, not here, another church I was serving, and I had preached on Daniel and talked about Daniel praying three times, and, and he was walking out the door, and you can see he's sort of beaming with pride, his chest is sort of puffed up, and, and I know I'm getting ready to get a good story. He's proud of himself, and he says, Preacher, I'm leaving here thinking I'm a lot like Daniel. I thought, well, that's great. How so? And he said, well, I, uh, I pray three times a day. I said, brother, and I'm not going to call his name, I said, brother, you realize... That ain't just praying about food, right? <laughs> that we see that that for some of us is the only time in which we go to God. I pray three times a day too because I bless my food. Yes, that counts. But if you want to get in on a technicality, <laughs> let's let that be our starting off point. Let's that let that be our jumping off point. Because something as small and insignificant as simply taking a minute or two minutes out of your time in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, mid-morning, mid-afternoon, late at night when you're laying in whenever it is, something as small as a few minutes can become a vehicle through which God uses to prepare us for something much more daunting down the road. If you haven't been through some tough stuff, friends, you will. That's life. It's coming. Prepare now. Pray now. I mean, surely Daniel never would have imagined that he would be faced with the situation that he was, except for maybe he would have. I mean, think about this. Daniel is a very smart young man. He knows ins and outs and things. He has he's elevated very quickly. He's climbed this corporate ladder and this business world mentality, if you will, to where he's like right under the king. So he's a pretty savvy fellow. And he would have known that these men were plotting behind his back, nipping at his peels, trying to get the best of him. And so you can imagine that in those times in which he's preparing himself and he's going before God, he's talking to God, at some point in time he would have thought, God, I'm going to have to do something hard. I know it. And so his prayer would have sounded a lot like Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in which he pours out his heart and simply says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So Daniel faced a, a similar fate as Jesus. He faced capital punishment. I mean, that's what it was. It was a form of capital punishment. Whether it was the cross that Christ hung on or whether it was the, the den of lions that Daniel was, was tossed into. At that point in time, that was capital punishment. And so the threat of death was used to try and manipulate these men. Whether it was Daniel or whether it was Jesus. And honestly, friends, that's what the powers and principalities in our lives continue to do. is to use fear and ultimately death to try and manipulate us 
into doing things. Maybe even things that God would not have us to do. I've wrestled with this for a very long time. As Christians, as people who honestly claim to believe in Jesus Christ and the resurrection and the hope and the everlasting life and in communion with God and a kingdom eternal and all and all and all the words that we could use, we sure are a group of people who are scared to die. We do anything we can to preserve life. Maybe even things God doesn't want us to do. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am not fatalistic. I am not one of those that really wants to go out and, and, and die tomorrow. i got a lot of stuff I want to do. I'm getting ready to go on vacation. But this is where... This is where the devil wins in our lives sometimes by planting that seed of fear, of doubt, and the threat of death into our minds and into our hearts. Daniel is a good reminder of what it means to not give in to that fear. We also learn one more important lesson from Daniel, and that's the power of prayer. That prayer prepares us. I try saying that five times fast. Prayer prepares us. As the popular saying go, prayer doesn't change things, it changes me. That prayer doesn't change things, it changes me. We must be careful about how we pray. Because, friends, if you're sitting there praying for this situation and things to change, and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray, and then you get mad at God when the things don't change, even though you haven't been willing to change in your life in any way, shape, or form, or you haven't been willing to roll up your sleeves and, and get into the lives of others, or you haven't been willing to go and to walk alongside somebody, instead you just simply pass it off and say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm thinking we might be doing it wrong. Prayer is a challenging thing and prayer is a dangerous thing because you just never know how God might answer that prayer. There was a scene from a movie a few years back. Um, the movie was Evan Almighty. I don't know if you ever saw that movie or not. Steve Carell plays a, a character who is called to, to be a Noah figure and to build an ark uh, up in Washington because there's a flood coming and it's a comedy, but it, there's also so many moments of just sheer brilliance in the movies and some of the things that were said. I highly recommend it. It's a pr- fairly clean, fairly fr- family-friendly movie. Um, but there's a clip I want to show you that comes from this movie. Um, and, and, and his wife, uh, the Noah figure, Steve Carell's wife, has, has sort of taken the kids and gone away because she thinks her husband's crazy. And so she leaves, and she has a conversation. You got it up there? Is it in there? There we go. She has a conversation with the God figure, played by Morgan Freeman. Check this out. Excuse great movie. And, and a great point. And, and, and I can't say it enough that there, it's not a simply being zapped with those warm, fuzzy feelings. It's you're given opportunities. Hear this story. Don't, don't hear this story wrong. God wasn't faithful to Daniel just because he had prayed. Okay? God was faithful to Daniel even before he started praying. That God was there in the midst and intervening in Daniel's life even before he was held into, drug into captivity in, in Babylon. God was already there acting. And that God would provide opportunities for those prayers to be answered. God would provide opportunities for Daniel to prove his faithfulness. Not to God, but to the world. Because Daniel's life was being pointed back to God. Friends, this week, 
you're going to have opportunities that you may or may not have been praying for, but, but opportunities are to come for you to respond one way or the other, to respond faithfully or to respond in ways that are, are less than desirable. And through the power of prayer, you're going to be changed in a significant way. Last point of this story, as we've gone through these stories, we find that God intervenes and God saves. In every single story that we've gone through over the last five weeks, God intervenes and God saves. It's pretty much standard for all of the Old Testament if you really think about it. And whether it was Noah's family before the flood or the Hebrew people in Egypt or, or any other stories we've read, jo- Joshua, David, Daniel... Samson. God somehow, some way saves. And any time we as Christians think about a God who saves, our logical next step is to think about the ultimate act of salvation that we find in our life, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So may you have faith like Daniel. And may you be changed through the power of prayer so that you can live your life pointing to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.